Дорогие друзья, вот и закончилась очередная программа «На звук душа отозвалась». Сегодня мы ее посвятили памяти выдающегося текста прошлых лет Георгия Павловича Виноградова. Выпуск подготовили и провели журналист Владимир Заика, редактор Ольга Басинская, звукорежиссер Татьяна Третьякова. Мы желаем всем нашим слушателям здоровья, благополучия и хорошего настроя, то есть настроения. И до встречи на волне радио «Голос России» ровно через неделю. программу Всемирной русской службы радиокомпании «Голос России». Мы снова выйдем в эфир в 15 часов по всемирному или в 19 по московскому времени в направлении стран Азии, Ближнего, Среднего и Дальнего Востока на волнах 16, 19, 25, 41, 228, 256 и 490 метров. Вы также можете слушать нас в интернете в режиме Royal Audio, Адрес 3w.voa.org Пишите нам улица Пятницкая, 25, Москва, 113-326, Россия. Наш телефон 950-68-68, факс 950-61-16, электронная почта letters at voa.org Russia World Service, which broadcasts its programs 15 hours a day, every day in the week.
You can hear news bulletin every hour on the hour with news and brief on the half hour, as well as daily and weekly features dealing with international and domestic issues. We also have some musical programs which will give you an insight to what is happening on the music scene here in Russia. So tune in to the Voice of Russia World Service. This is the Voice of Russia World Service. Here's the news. First, the headlines. Former head of UN Weapons Inspections denies allegations that Iraq is trying to acquire a mass destruction capability. The Palestinians say they reject terrorism in whatever form. Europe's security organization, the OSCE, is holding a conference in Warsaw. Those were the headlines and now the news in full. Former head of United Nations Arms Monitoring, Scott Ritter, says his experience with Iraq has led him to believe that country is not trying to develop a mass destruction capability. Speaking before the Iraqi parliament on Sunday, he said Iraq poses no threat to anyone and the military attack on it would be totally unjustified. In its main official paper today, Iraq says the United States and Great Britain are whipping up scares about alleged mass destruction weaponry on its soil in order to have an excuse for a planned operation to topple President Saddam Hussein. It says Iraq has never possessed or even developed mass destruction arsenals. President George Bush and Prime Minister Tony Blair spoke about mass destruction threats from Iraq after emerging from closed-door consultations in Camp David on Friday. 84% of the respondents in a Voice of Russia web poll believe the U.S. would not strengthen international peace by attacking Iraq. 46% suspect an American design to lay hands on Iraq's oil reserves. 33% believe the U.S. is after showing its military might to the rest of the world. 66% object against the American classification of Iraq as part of the global axis of evil. Most residents believe that taking military action against a sovereign nation requires advance authorization by the United Nations. They also say the United Nations must lift its sanctions against Iraq as soon as that country readmits international weapons inspectors. British trade union leader Bill Morris believes his country is edging towards totalitarian rule as it takes on terrorism. In an interview with The Guardian ahead of this year's Trade Union Congress, which opens in Blackpool on Tuesday, he also says that British participation in an attack on Iraq would spell a catastrophic split within the governing Labour Party. By pledging to support Tony Blair in his struggle against terrorism, Mr. Morris points out the Unionists did not mean they would support a rollback of democracy or new military action in the Gulf. The Guardian says all that concerns Iraq will feature prominently at the Congress in Blackpool. Yasser Arafat says his administration decisively rejects terrorism in whatever form. He spoke about this before his parliament, which went into session in Ramallah on Monday, after a six-month break because of Israeli occupation of Palestinian territories. Mr. Arafat accused Israel of using the struggle against terrorism as a pretext to advance the colonization of Arab land by Jews. He also insisted that Palestinians, not the Israelis, are the main victims of Middle East terrorism. The Palestinian leader said he was prepared to step down if required to do so by parliament. Some 500 delegates from the 65 member nations of Europe's security body, OSCE, have opened a 10-day conference in Warsaw on how to reconcile the struggle against extremism and terrorism with the defense of human rights. The Portuguese Foreign Minister Antonio Martins de Cruz, who currently chairs the OSCE, opened the forum by saying the campaign against terrorism must be at the top of the international agenda. Maoist guerrillas have torched buildings and killed nearly 60 police officers and soldiers in an overnight attack on the Nepalese town of Sandy Harka, some 300 kilometers west of the capital, Kathmandu. The government has dispatched reinforcements to deal with the attack. Nepal's Maoists are after toppling the monarchy in their conflict-wrecked South Asian country. 
They also want to disrupt the next general elections in December. Just to remind you, this news is coming to you from the studios of the Voice of Russia World Service. Moscow believes Russia and the European Union make progress in solving the Kaliningrad issue that arises after the EU expansion. The deputy Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Razov made this statement after his talks with the EU officials in Moscow. He said that the Russian president had proposed to introduce a non-visa regime for the residents of Russia and the EU in a few years. Until then, Russia proposes to preserve a simplified regime for the transit of people and goods between the Kaliningrad region and the rest of Russia. At the talks, Russia informed the EU officials about the technical details of transit. People in Moscow have marked three years on Saturday midnight since a terrorist bomb destroyed a southeastern housing estate, killing 94 people. Reeves were laid and prayers said. A little over four days after the first explosion, a similar one demolished another apartment block in the southeast, with the loss of 121 lives. According to the Federal Security Service, both bombings had been masterminded by the Jordanian-born Chechen terrorist Hatab, who was later killed by Russian officers. The actual bomber, named Achimet Gochiaev, is believed to be hiding in Georgia, south of the main Caucasus range. He is now on the international wanted list. According to Finance Minister Alexei Kudrin, the regional arrears in public sector pay have shrank from $100 million to a little over $30 million over the past 30 days. He attributes the result to federal help. The minister points out that all federal employees are paid on time. Russian experts have launched a series of controlled explosions to destroy the unrecovered parts of the torpedo section of the nuclear submarine Kursk that went down during a botched Baron Sea exercise two years ago, with the loss of all 118 crew members. Underwater video equipment is being extensively employed. The main body of the Kursk was raised to the surface last autumn. Most of the torpedo section, too, was gently winched up in June. The current demolition operation is aimed at removing possible impediment to shipping in the area. According to Prime Minister Mikhail Kasyanov, Chechnya has taken in 350,000 tons of grain, its biggest harvest in history. Tractors, trucks and combined harvesters from neighboring regions have been hard at work. Agriculture is the economic mainstay of Chechnya. Wildfires around the Russian capital Moscow are on the wane after weeks of sustained effort by thousands of firefighters and dozens of plane and helicopter crews. According to Emergencies Minister Sergei Shoigu, bulldozer teams aided by air tankers have largely put down blazers in forests and successfully contained them in peat fields. There is wane in the forecast and the change of the wind has blown noxious haze out of Moscow's streets. The Madhouse, a film by Russian filmmaker Andrei Konchalovsky, has won a special prize from the panel of judges at the Venice Film Festival. Magdalene's Sisters by British filmmaker Peter Mullen has been named as the winner of the festival. The Best Actress Prize has been awarded to Julian Moore of the United States for the part she played in the film Far From Heaven. An Italian actor has got the Best Actor Prize for his performance in Michelle Pacido's film The Travel Called Love. The awarding ceremony on Sunday ended the 10-day-long film festival, one of the most prestigious in Europe. The American Red Herring magazine, named the pioneering Russian software for computerized stereoscopic image recognition by programmer Oleg Sutin from Nizhny Novgorod, among the 10 greatest human inventions so far this year. It expects a range of breathtaking applications, from watching distant galaxies to recognizing a known terrorist in a thick crowd. That was the news, and now the headlines once again. Former head of UN weapons inspections denies allegations that Iraq is trying to acquire a mass destruction capability. The Palestinians say they reject terrorism in whatever form. Europe's security organization, OSCE, is holding a conference in Warsaw. And there we end this bulletin of news brought to you by the Voice of Russia World Service.
of Russia World Service with its daily feature, News and News. Hello and welcome to the program. In this edition, we'll bring you a review of responses from experts and public throughout the world to U.S. plans for Iraq. Also a preview to the United Nations General Assembly session and other items. In the coming few weeks, the George Bush administration is sending government emissaries to 40 countries, including Russia, to consult them on Iraq and set forth its apprehensions for Iraqi armament programs. We have a commentary by the Voice of Russia observer, Yuri Soltan, and this is what he writes. The administration in Washington has been using all means available to mobilize support for its planned strike at Iraq. So far, the United Kingdom has been the only country to unconditionally support Washington. When President Bush met with the British Prime Minister, Tony Blair, on Saturday, the two reached a clear understanding about the need to use force to overthrow the Saddam Hussein regime. On Sunday, leading U.S. administration officials came down on Iraq in a propaganda salvo to accuse it of all sins. State Secretary Colin Powell said Washington was prepared to act on its own against Baghdad. Vice President Dick Cheney charged Baghdad with developing nuclear weapons and Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld insisted that Iraq had been repeatedly violating the UN resolution on disarmament. But the Bush administration has been furnishing no evidence and indefinitely delaying the publication of facts. So far, accusations of Iraq have been absolutely unsubstantiated, just as is a report currently in the making in London on Iraqi weapons of mass destruction. According to a source in British Special Services, the report offers no sensational facts and hence cannot serve as the basis for an unconditional military operation against Iraq. An official spokesman for the International Atomic Energy Agency, which inspects Iraq for nuclear disarmament moves, claims that his agency has had of late no information whatsoever about any nuclear activity in Iraq. According to the official, the report of the International Atomic Energy Agency about Iraq's nuclear program that George Bush and Tony Blair refer to actually points out that the International Atomic Energy Agency has discovered no evidence of Iraq's engagement in building nuclear arms. The former head of the UN weapons inspectors in Iraq, Scott Ritter, feels that a strike at Baghdad today would be absolutely unjustified because, he says, Iraq does not develop weapons of mass destruction. The situation could be clarified by a return of the UN experts to Iraq. Russia sees this as indispensable, provided their mandate and the duration of mission are clearly determined. Moscow wants a political settlement of the Iraqi problem which would help find a long-term solution in the interests of regional stability. That was a commentary by the Voice of Russia observer, Yuri Sultan. America's mounting urge to attack Iraq is meeting with warnings and even protests from the rest of the world. More on the subject from our news analyst, Sergei Frolov. In 1991, the United States led a coalition of more than 15 countries and acted under a United Nations mandate when it moved against Iraq. Today the situation is different. Very few of America's coalition allies of that time, both in Europe and among the Arab nations, 
assure its conviction, there must be military action against Iraq. Let's see why. <laughs>